It's a blue world without you. It's a blue world alone. My days and nights that once were filled with heaven, with you away. How empty they have grown It's a blue world From now on It's a true world For me The sea, the sky, my heart and I we're all an indigo hue Without you It's a blue, blue world Hi, welcome to Seen and Heard. I'm Melia Bensusan, uh, your artistic director here at Hartford Stage in this beautiful theater and thrilled to welcome you for another conversation about what's happening on our stage and how it, you know, to excite you to come and see this and learn more about the craft we practice in our theater. So uh, first, a thank you to those of you who joined us for The Mousetrap, which was really such a joyous way to start this season. The energy of that production has really launched us and we're excited to continue now with It's a Wonderful Life, a, a live radio play. Uh, the best way to see It's a Wonderful Life is to uh, purchase a five play subscription. And we know that life happens and planning is complicated. So we allow you to switch your tickets for any performance. It's a, a really completely flexible plan. So that's my pitch to you. We need you. We need you to subscribe. We need you in our theater. We're excited for this show. Um, and without further ado, we're going to start talking about this production of It's a Wonderful Life. And before um, we do that, normally we start with a scene. So I'm going to first, because we're just doing a little different tonight, uh, Liam, I'm going to invite Liam Bellman Sharp to join me here. And then we're going to see Liam is our Foley artist for It's a Wonderful Life. Hello, Liam. Welcome to Seen and Heard. We're so happy you're here. having trouble hearing you i don't know if others are if that's oh, sorry. oh there you go there you go perfect thank you so much um so liam one of the really one of the most fun things about this production is the foley work can you tell us we're about to see a sample of some of the tricks of the trade if you will can you tell us a little bit about what we're about to see totally yeah so um I feel like Foley is one of those things that it's like kind of a, a secret behind the scenes thing that like actually a lot of people know about. And if you don't know about it, then you've definitely experienced it, um, you know, sort of adding a lot to a story. Um, it's a discipline that sort of dates back to the advent of like movies with sound. Um, certainly like Foley was used in radio dramas, but it wasn't called that as such. And, and it's often used in film to like um, add sounds that, supplement the visuals so basically right. anything from the fabric of someone's clothing swishing to like right. the door closing to anything someone being punched in the face it's all you know there's a human making a sound who's not on screen who's doing this in the studio. right and so now with this production we get to see you on stage make all these sounds and we have a little clip of you yeah. demonstrating do you do you remember which i know we did this maybe all of yesterday so maybe it's no, uh so, so <laughs> okay. Is, is me basically, I had a little, a little table set up, kind of a big table at the back of the stage with a bunch of different toys. Um, yeah. Different sounds. You're gonna see me just kind of go through them. Uh, you know, basically right to left. Um, not really in the sense that they appear in the show, but just to kind of give you an overview of the kind of, you know, what the process looks like, what it sounds like, and, you know, 
Yeah, what it, what's kind of going on. Awesome. Like you're playing the xylophone, you're slamming a door. We're going to just Absolutely. get a little taste. Absolutely. Here we go. Thank you so much. Turn around. It's so fun. Made me, you know, I didn't, I didn't fully get the uh, ice cream scoop at scooper at first, and then you hear it and you go, oh, really, really fun. Thank you so much. Let me have some more folks join us to talk about your work, Liam, and this production. So the the adapter, the writer of this version. Uh, and I think many of you watching this, being our great fans of Hartford Stage, might might be aware that we did this production last season, right? This is a remounting of last season's production. We were so pleased with it, but it has some changes. Um, and Joe can share some of that with us. And two of the great changes, well, one of them is Liam joining us as Foley artist, and then Godfrey and Zoe, if you'll both join us as well. Zoe Golub Sass is helming this production and can talk to us a bit about what it is to direct something that has been done, kind of have the framework, but have your own creative insights on how to change it up. So welcome, Zoe, who's also artistic associate at Hartford Stage. And Godfrey, welcome, Godfrey. In between two different rehearsals, Mr. Simmons is all over downtown Hartford today. So we're grateful to have you for the amount of time we have you. I know you need to go to a heartbeat ensemble. <laughs> so we'll, but, um, uh, so Joe, let me start with you in terms of just tell us a little bit about the idea to make It's a Wonderful Life, a live radio play. We know it's a film, um, but, this is a different, this is, and, um, and to be clear, it's not on the radio, it's on our stage, it's right there with Liam performing and Godfrey performing, but tell us about where, how this came to be, Joe. Sure thing. Well, well, great to see you, Amelia, and oh, Zoe, and all of you. And and it's such an honor to be back at Hartford again this year. It was such a thrill last year, and happy to share. Going back to the beginning of um, my journey with Wonderful Life, and I originally adapted the play as a full stage version, like not a radio play, but kind of like a stage adaptation of the the film. And that I'm from here in Connecticut. I've lived in Fairfield most of my life, and the original production was done um, at the suggestion of my good friend. Uh, Frank Congello, who I think might be watching tonight, but um, she um, had a has a um, uh, she's a drama teacher at uh, Fairfield Aldo High School, and she was looking for an adaptation of It's a Wonderful Life to do, and and asked if I would do one. And I'd been a fan of the film, so I was like, okay, cool. So did that, and it was um, it was somewhat different than the film. It was a bit more in the um, the style of Thornton Wilder, a little bit our town, and focused right. more on the you know the third section of the film um, and the the unborn sequence, and took that to some different 
places that it doesn't go in the version that you're doing. <laughs> um, but uh, so that that full stage version was done for a few seasons, and then it was readapted as a radio play. I had um, a theater company of, of mine down in uh, Stanford, and we did it down there one season and started with a cast of 12. Then the next year, we're like, oh, maybe we can do it with 10. Maybe we can do it with eight. Like every year, it just sort of got the cast got smaller. They had more to do. It just became more dynamic that way. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, so it was done down in Stanford in the 90s, and then um, it started getting done here and there around the country, and then it was eventually published, and um, it's been such a thrill to be involved with productions like yours and to revisit it somewhere every year and try to look at it fresh, and I'm sure that's probably something you're doing also. I'm, I'm really curious about the remounting because I only know some of, some of what you're going to talk about, so I'm, right. I'm an audience member as well tonight. Awesome. <laughs> so, uh, you, yeah. you just to say, and also please put questions in the chat. I got a little flustered at the beginning of our broadcast tonight, so I didn't say any of the important things. I did say come to the theater, that's the most important. Uh, put questions in the chat, any comments for all of us, we'll be, we'll be monitoring it. Um, Joe, you had the idea of making it like a radio play because of the connection of when this when it was written, what tell us about sort of this connection between the heyday of radio theater and It's a Wonderful Life. Sure. Well, it is, it's it's a title that um, kind of fits perfectly into the um, the heyday of, of the golden age of radio and like the 1930s into the 1940s and a bit into the 50s was when they would take a lot of Hollywood properties and they would turn them into half hour, hour long radio dramas, sometimes with the original actors and sometimes with different actors. It would be a way to keep the actors in the limelight, but also to highlight the films themselves and the, the relationship between radio and Hollywood. And so I was, I was really sort of fascinated by that. And um, I wrote this adaptation between, uh, before realizing that there were at least a couple of different versions of Wonderful Life that existed back then with, with Jimmy Stewart and Donna Reed. And um, in listening to those since, it's been, um, it's been interesting to see how they cut it down to, I mean, in one case, I think it's like 20 something minutes, but it's a very <laughs> abridged version. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I just think it, it's, it's a, I found it a really um, unique storytelling, the, a theatrical storytelling technique, because I feel like it, it engages the imagination the way all good theater does, but, but it sort of encourages you to, to lean forward and kind of paint the picture in your mind, you know, the, the, right. the golden age of radio would be called theater of the imagination and it kind of it, it helps you sort of make up your own version, you know, what, what you're seeing is kind of happening in your head as you're watching it and listening to it and I just think that's a really fascinating hybrid. Godfrey, you're playing George, right? George Bailey. Indeed. Tell us about a little bit about your relationship to this story and, uh, well, and this movie. Well, or um, maybe that's <laughs> well, look, look, well, first, uh, um, thanks. Great to see everybody. Uh, great to meet you virtually, Joe. Um, yeah, I tell you, for me, um, I can't watch the movie, you know, without crying at the end. Right. I can't read the script <laughs> without weeping at the end. Um, the and it's and it's and it's interesting. Um, and and I've watched it in different parts of my life. Right. I watched it when I was a kid, and I was I I was obsessed with the with a bunch of the movies, notwithstanding kind of like what was going on in terms of like race or gender and all right. this. Right. right like I was obsessed with those with those movies and those actors um it just it's kind of like my like my thing I was just obsessed with them so to be able to kind of slip into that era not just the role and and not just the piece yeah. of the era is 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 really really exciting for me and it's also exciting for me uh, to slip into that era as a black man to and be really like intentional about that and about kind of yeah. like what like what that was like then in terms of just just kind of um you know moving through the world right and so yeah. it's just exciting to kind of think about that and just have that in the room on the stage in my mind uh in my body as i kind of move through move through the piece um, yeah yeah it's yeah. it's and and the fact part of what um i love about you being a part of this and Zoe sharing this with you since this was a, 
something we both felt so enthusiastic about is not only do we know you as a brilliant actor from many other places and moments in life, right? We go way back, but um, how much you're a part now of the Hartford arts and culture landscape. And so how meaningful it, it is, I think, that you're playing George Bailey in mm. Hartford at this time. Yeah, no, it's, I, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I feel pretty blessed to be, uh, to be both be working on the piece and that, you know, Zoe and you commiserating on that, the, the, the idea of, of me performing in it. And uh, it's been great, you know. I'm, not commiserating, I'm, sir, celebrating. Uh, <laughs> celebrating, not commiserating. Exactly. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, um, as, uh, you know, artistic director of Heartbeat Ensemble, it's just been really amazing, just the open arms of folks. Um, I've been here for three years and um, the open arms of folks, uh, you know, coming here to, to Hartford and, and working with different folks. I'm about to, what I'm in between the rehearsal for is a little bit of death, uh, number seven, which is a, um, uh, a, a storytelling event that was created by uh, Sula Net, and that's happening this weekend, Friday and Saturday at 7.30 um, p.m. And I, I'll be, I'll be uh, storytelling on the Saturday at 7.30, if anyone's interested in that. And, uh, and a little bit of death is all about, um, you know, investigating what you're, what you're letting go of. Um, that's the death in the title, right? Like, what are you letting go of in your life? And, and what was that like for you? Um, so it's been great. I, Hartford <laughs> is amazing. The folks, you know, they, everybody here is amazing. Um, there's a lot of arts going on here. And right. what I like about A Wonderful Life is its accessibility, that it can still feel like it's, you know, that it feels like it's at home in Hartford. And that's what's so great about the, kind of like putting it back into the play. I just think that there's, there's so many rich things. There's the deep vein of kind of like the local color stuff. I won't give it away, but there's like local stuff, you know, kind of woven in it, right? which is cool. But there's something about just the story about community um, in it, about community building and maintaining community that I think is really relevant, and really resonant uh, for, um, for Hartford in a really, really different way. I agree. And 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 so let me bring it back sort of to what it's been like in the rehearsal room. Zoe, if you'll join us as well in this. I love Zoom because when people, you know, un unmute, then you know they're like game ready to go. Exactly. It's I don't know how I would do this not on Zoom anymore. <laughs> Social cues are hard in person. Yeah. It's exactly right. It's really a great shortcut. Yeah. Um, so Zoe and Godfrey, don't you mute and, and Liam come back too. Come on all. And Liam, be sure to talk into your mic. We have a note from, uh, that we're. Hopefully it's better now. What's it like in the room right now? What are you guys up to share with an audience? What, what's happening right now in rehearsal as you reinvent, adapt, Integrate an adaptation of an ad, you know, and of adaptation. It's a, uh, it's you know, um, absolutely. Tell us what's going on. <laughs> so, really, technically, what we're up to right now, we're in the third week of rehearsal, and um, we've gone through and staged the show um, a couple times. We've done a couple passes, and now we're stumbling through. It's our first run throughs. We call them stumble throughs. Right. Um, and part of I think what what's come up, what Joe is, what everyone's saying is that. The play is so flexible and the story is so flexible, but also can be hyper local. Like we have these moments of Hartford popping out. We've set the radio station in Hartford, but there's also so much room and necessity to make the play suit the company and to figure and to really build the world and the sense of humor and the um, the heart around the acting company and the Foley artists and just kind of the the ensemble that's making it. So right now, um, kind of as we were, we've got our sea legs in the play, we're um, taking great moments from last year and we have um, returning actors, Evan Zess and Jennifer Borellis and finding, you know, so we've got a lot of wonderful moments from last year, but are also coming up with a lot of new, um, new approaches and new moments and uh, some really fun new jokes. 
got some new jokes we worked on today. I can't wait. I, I've been missing out. It is interesting, right? I mean, you put a bunch of theater people in a room and you never make the same thing twice. Right. I, I, I think even if it were the same people, you just don't make the same thing twice. It, we've changed, it's a year later. And now with, you know, with Nicole and Liam and Godfrey as our three new members. Uh, Price Waldman is. Um, Price, yeah. And Price, right. Mm -hmm. there, yeah, there's, um, I was listening to a podcast about they play, the play and they're saying it's a, it's a Rorschach test for our beliefs and like what we're looking for in our lives. Right. And um, there's something about how many people worked on the original screenplay. Um, at one, you know, in, invisibly. So I think Dorothy Parker might have done a little bit. They say Inch. Joe, I'm sure, knows a lot uh, <laughs> about this. But and that um, there's a married couple uh, that was involved, and Capra drove them crazy. But some people say that's part of why the marriage in the play is so interesting, is because is Francis Goodrich and Albert. Oh yeah, Hackett, yeah, yeah. Hackett, I think. Hackett. Hackett. Yeah. 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 Um, and apparently he gave them notes, and they said one day, you know according to a podcast and one day they said oh yeah yeah, yeah we'll take them and then left <laughs> don't, don't, don't try this at home no one leaves yeah. the rehearsal room in that way yes, right? no, yeah. but, um, but in terms of like how many entry points there are into the play yeah. for people to knock on doors and exactly open exactly right um what are you thinking godfrey what was it like in terms of stumbling through you stumbled through act one today does george feel I mean, this sort of, in, you've had this relationship with this story from the outside for so long, and then to feel yourself inside it. it um, it's rare to do something so iconic, is I guess is. what I'm thinking. What's interesting is for me, and I don't say this often, I, I've done a lot of, a lot of plays uh, in, in my uh, career. I've been very fortunate. But I just, um, like, I get, I get George and I get his struggle and I get that thing of, of, you know, wanting to kind of bust out and, and explore things, but be feeling a little trapped by, you know, by your community and you have had an imagination that goes beyond your community and you're struggling to figure out how you can actually um, put your imagination toward your community, right? The one that you're actually in. And that's a real struggle when you want to kind of go out and just, you know, do great things and make great things. Yeah. I, that doesn't feel like work to me to understand that, that, that journey. And again, the story is just so um, uh, powerful. And I think George's journey is so powerful. Uh, it, it's so it's just familiar too. Right. I mean, that's part of what you're okay. saying. It's so familiar, his story. It, it is it a, a sense of what we're supposed to be doing in this life. And then the day to day of it or the scale of it, the frustration yeah. and the somehow frustration, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. this story kind of lifts out that story and makes us feel seen, but lifted. Right. It's bigger than us. Yeah. I Listen, it's. It's a joy. It's the word, you know, I love saying the words, like I love the words and I, I just, I, I love the story. It's just a great story. It's like when you can let the story kind of carry you, I mean, what more can you, what more can you ask for? Um, you know, there, there, you know, there are a lot of great stories out there that like, you know, you know, allow, allow, allow you to be carried by them. Right. You know, right. like I, I, you know, I think of like anything that Lorraine Hansberry wrote, or um, I think of, uh, um, you know, I, I I think of some of, you know, Tony Kushner's stuff. There are these things where like, you you just get carried by the story. And if you, and, and as an actor, if you can kind of sit in it and be carried by it and be the vessel for it. And that's what it feels like in the room for me. Most right. times to not. Sometimes it's about like, okay, what's the bit? I mean, you know. <laughs> right. And this one, I mean, you've got also this, you're playing an actor playing George Bailey. Yeah. You're Those, playing that's a cool. Foley artist in a studio. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's cool. And that's fun because it's relationships between us, right? We're, there's a kind of fun that's happening as we're telling that story. Right. So, which is good because it gives you a little buffer in between, you know, these iconic roles and like this actor who's playing this role, right? Um, it, you know, it kind of, it feels actually a healthy way to do the piece. That's fun. That's fun. Yeah, it, in some ways, it feels like an on road, an on ramp for the audience to enter in, and that's like some of the pleasure of the radio plays. We get to watch the actors navigate each other, um, and so then in some of those bits of navigating each other, we're kind of there's room for us to be in on the in on the joke, but then in on the journey once we're there. Uh, Liam, how much are you improvising? How much do you follow a script? What's your balance as a Foley artist in the room? Totally. Um, I think there's always a bit of improvisation that happens, but uh, the, I guess the thing that sort of keeps me on the rails uh, a little bit is the fact that, you know, I've got my, the rest of my ensemble sort of depending on me to like open the door at the right time and pick up the phone at the right time. So <laughs> I, I, I do stick to a script which I'm sort of finding myself following less than I anticipated. I was sort of anticipating following it pretty closely. I'm going to wind up being more off book than I expected, which is fun. Um, really, and every time I've done something like this, you know, live Foley or kind of, I'm also a musician, like a company, a play live. It really feels like you're you're doing a dance with, um, you know, your kind of co-performers who who have language to, to deliver. Um, you know, a lot of the communication is, some of it's verbal, some of it's non-verbal, certainly like a lot of what I'm providing is non-verbal, but it really feels like you're doing this dance together. Um, and, you know, there's kind of a give and take to that. And uh, synchronization is really important. And so rehearsal for that is, is really important. Um, but yeah, it's, it's incredibly lively uh, and, and sort of invigorating to perform in this capacity. I've, I've likened it a few times to certainly the stumbles that we've done so far. It feels like you're rolling down a hill. The show just has this incredible momentum. Right. Um, and once you're on the train, you're really on the train. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It does. It. I mean, it's a piece of music you're all composing together, right? I mean, totally. Zoe conducting and the... The, where the lines come in and where the sound effects come in uh, very much, yeah. I would think, you know. Oh, totally, which, yeah, no, and that's it's really fun, as well as this sort of being this angle of, um, you know, it's, it's actors playing actors, playing characters. There is also this thing of like, we're doing this for the audience that is in the, that is in the theater with us, but also the audience that is like listening at home, um, <laughs> which I think gives you a whole, there are like so many different levels that this thing is being played at. Um, yeah, it's, it's just really fun. I think there are so many kind of, you know, leaps of imagination that the audience right. is, is invited to make. And I think that that, you know, they become the sort of like third partner in that dance. Um, and the, the different sort of spheres of imagination become the floor of that dance as well as the physical space of the theater. Right, just to share with our audience, right? So the conceit is that we're at a live radio broadcast of the play, It's a Wonderful Life. Yep. So it's a live studio audience. We'll have applause signs. You all have to pick up your cues when you're in the house, you, the audience, and, and applaud on cue. Um, but there's also then the dynamic of what's being heard, what's broadcast, versus what's being seen. So I don't know, Godfrey, I know we're gonna lose you in a minute, but how much how much are you playing with that of knowing that as a radio actor, there is a consciousness of what's heard, but there's a live audience, which is of course a theater audience. How does that impact your choices on a script? Well, it's, it's kind of in layers, right? So first you're trying to concentrate on, you know, you might be concentrating on the scene like what's happening in the dynamics of it. And then you're, then you're, and then the next layer is, okay, how is this sitting with the, like with the audience that's actually here? And then how is it sitting with the, with the audience? And of course that's, you know, what Zoe's doing is, is that, she, you know, she's clocking all that stuff in terms of just like, okay, like when, you know, what needs to be for the audience at home? What needs to be for the audience out here? And, and where is their tension between that? And so, you know, she's done a great job of kind of helping us to navigate that, you know, when do we need to see the Foley artist, when do we, you know, 
Um, it, what's fun is is that is trying to is like trying to maintain uh, the uh, the actual um, what's the word I'm looking for to the fidelity of what we're doing for the audience at home. Yes, you know, yes, while yes, jacking yes. each other while jacking each other up on stage, right? <laughs> I mean, I planned jacking each other up, okay? You know what I mean, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah great. we're not we're not going off the rails or anything like that, but just that kind of fun and and stuff, and the audience gets to see that stuff, and they have this experience while knowing that, like, well, we're not going to do that on the mic. That's kind of like, you know what I mean? It's great. Oh, I and, can't wait. I mean, it just sounds like so much fun to watch you is. all playing at it and even though I got to be a part of it when we first did it as I hear you all it feels completely new um, yeah, yeah I mean I don't know I'm uh, you know but but what's interesting I want to say this about the uh, the other actors are really they're amazing Price and Nicole and uh, uh Evan and uh you know Jennifer Jenny, they're, yeah. they're just amazing to work with and of course Liam uh you know uh you know they, they, they're just really great to play with. It's just, it's a delight. It's, it's a really, really it's getting a delight, to, so. to, to join a really festive, creative yeah. uh, hour and a half in a theater, right? Yeah, no, it's exciting. It's exciting. And so it's always doing a great job kind of navigating it all, so. Well, so I wanted to sort of turn to you, Zoe. I mean, how much, how much has this led you to think about radio theater or radio plays. I know during the pandemic, we were all kind of pushed into think, right? Liam, you're nodding. I'm guessing you had some pandemic adventures in radio. Theater. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm a sound designer primarily. So <laughs> plenty of, exactly. of radio drama during the pandemic. But but I wonder, Zoe, how, how that's influenced you or if, if that's been, you know, a, along with your podcasts and your research on this on this piece, how much the live radio theater piece is in your mind. Um, so I've been listening to some radio plays and uh, and what Joe mentioned, the radio plays of It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I've been doing a dive into there and then also listening to the ads. The advertising is very fun in the way the ads, you know, lace through and are involved in the, um, relate to the stories. Um, but I stumbled on a um, uh, a piece about it was actually about um radio plays and yiddish radio actually and talking about how yiddish radio i wasn't gonna go there but you yiddish have to go radio, there it's uh so on. yiddish radio they were saying that it was domestic and it was small you know it was about everyday problems and it was that famous one right the month um i'm thinking i'm thinking of the ones in english of like never mind keep going i and I'll say the dive is not, it's not very, very deep yet, but it's mostly been excerpts, but talking about how those were, the plays were the size of people oh. and a lot of other radio plays at the time were larger than life in a lot of ways mm -hmm. um, in this specific uh, era. And, um, you know, it was cowboys and ex like the world, the radio was bigger than every day. And something that I think is so exciting about this piece is that it does both. Yeah. Is that we have that every day and it's our way to get in because, you know, what they were saying is um, a lot of immigrants wanted to feel ref re uh, reflected in the material that they were hearing and the stories that they were consuming. Um, and so what this piece does and what Joe does so wonderfully is that we can all get in on the issues that are the size of us, but then it explodes open. It sort of goes back to what you said at the beginning, which I'm curious about, and and this notion of how this piece and Joe for you to join us as well, how much it becomes a bit of a Rorschach test, right? I know that when the movie famously uh, first came out, it was considered, you know, right, it was attacked for being socialist propaganda, right? That there was a kind of uh, uh, in the fear of. Uh, socialism and communism in this country, there were these associations with the community all giving together, right? And and the vision of this kind of American utopia. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, Godfrey. Have a great rehearsal. Thank you. See you thank soon. You. Hey, thank you all. Anyway, this, this notion of what we project onto this story. So 
Yeah, I don't know that I have much to add about that part about the 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 social and the the historical relevance of that. Uh -huh. I'm not sure, Zoe. I'm not, I don't know if you have you come across anything on that specifically, or um, uh, I think I actually there's the they published the report. I think it was um, uh, I can't remember exactly where I read it, but if it, it's online and I can you know try to find it, but um, where they talk about the they have the file. It's redacted. Right. But exactly. of the, the government file about this movie and the artists involved in yep. what it's saying, you know, anti-capitalist, you know, this communist movie. The danger, the danger of the left. It's sort of, you know. But it, it's it under the radar a little right. bit. Right. More than a lot of other things at the time. What do you think, what do we take away from it now? Different moment. What? Liam, you're in the room. Joe, you have lived in this for so long. Zoe, you're visiting it daily. What, what, what is it that jumps out at each of you from this version at this time? Yeah, I can, I can jump in on that. Um, so uh, I'll preface this by saying that this is actually my first uh, exposure to this story. Um, That's amazing. Had you never seen yeah. the film, Liam? You'd no, be... I hadn't. Um, right. You know, listeners at home might have picked up on the fact that I'm not from the US, I'm from Australia, and for whatever reason, uh, it, the film is just less big there, um, or at least I had, didn't encounter it before before coming here. Um, and I think that what really, you know, speaking uh, kind of more responding to uh, Zoe's comment about, you know, kind of joining the play at, at issues that are the size of you, uh, it really sort of, what strikes me, I guess, is the kind of this sort of like cyclical nature and the kind of perpetuity of of human struggle in a way like even though this you know is a story from a country that's that's different to the one that I grew up in uh at a, at a time you know well so well before I was born um yeah I was sort of echoing Godfrey it, it feels so familiar um and the struggles are sort of so relatable um and you know the, the sort of importance of of community uh both i think in terms of the content of the story but also the form in which we're telling this story um you know it's it's so community and sort of ensemble is so important to the the format and and to the story as well um and like those things still feel uh incredibly important and incredibly true and like grant the story and the project like a a huge sense of immediacy to me, um, despite my kind of distance from it in a way. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I would, I, I would say that um, this is one of the films. I mean, I, I knew it as a, well, obviously, I knew it as a film first because it was a film first. But uh, when I, when I saw the film when I was, when I was um, a kid growing up, I, I was just drawn to it. It seems so. Um, so fresh and modern for an old film. Now, I mean, I've always been into old film to silent movies and you know everything since, but it just, it really felt very, um, very modern for having seen it the first yeah. time. And like, you know, when I was a teenager or a little younger than that. And I found that growing up with it over the decades now that it's been one of those stories that every time you come back to it, it just, it touches you in a different way because you're in a different part of your life and how, the story of George and the other characters in It's a Wonderful Life uh, relate to who we are as humans and what, what it means to be alive and what it means to touch as many lives as we touch, even though we may need to be reminded of that from time to time. But I think that that universality is something that is always fresh and modern. And especially, especially now since the pandemic and, you know, the, the, immediacy of being together in the same space and the, just the sharing the the present moment and the present time and and you know and all of that i just think is is really it goes so well with the story and um i find that really special about it so i didn't know if you wanted to add to that zoe i was did i was gonna talk about a little the design of it and ask you to kind of speak on how this adaptation is both celebrating radio plays, but kind of breaks out of that as well. Yeah, the um, we have a really wonderful team of designers um, and uh, 
from the the costumes, everyone looks fabulous. Liam's costume. Liam got a hat today. That I, love oh. it. I feel I feel so spick and yeah. wonderful in my costume. It's the real trait. So just so much detail around who these people are that we're meeting and um, our uh, set lighting and sound team um, have really created a very playful space. It's a, really a playground where we can start in that reality, but then break open. And um, it's like the set, it, it, the set lights and sound have their own imagination and just take off. And it's a very playful vocabulary. Um, uh, there, we're, um, it's very surprising, uh, and we're trying to just in this in George's journey in Pottersville. He's like going. He's opening every door and trying to see what's behind and trying to try something new and see if that will solve. The problem and so Quite literally and, opening doors literally. is what I'm saying here is that it, it the stage gives you Liam gives us in many ways the best of the theater of the imagination of the radio plays but part of what you're doing is making this gymnasium feeling of actors moving in in a theater space in a way that we don't get to in any other you know, see actors moving and relating to physical space in a yeah. very different way than we do through other art forms. Yeah, as the the um, play, the emotion of the play takes hold, the world kind of cracks open and we see it in a new way. Um, and the actors break open in new ways. So we break the rules of the radio play world and get to en enjoy the, all of the tricks and uh, surprises of the of the environment of the theater as well as of the radio vocabulary. Really cool. Um, what other, are there any questions in the chat that we've missed before we turn through? So when do you, so you're in the rehearsal room, how much longer, Zoe? Tell, talk us through the process of what happens next for you as the director. So what happens next, we are in the rehearsal room, um, through this weekend. And then uh, we have two more days next week. So um, we have like five more days in the rehearsal room. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> over the next few days, we'll be running the show and working in new props. Liam will get some new toys for Foley, um, reworking moments. And, um, and then uh, a week from tomorrow, we go into the theater and we're joined by um, the designers and the production staffs and the technical departments who have people from the electrics department, props, costumes, just everyone is flocks to the theater and we put everything together. So it's rehearsal, but um, we have the lights and the costumes and the sound and we're reworking moments all together. And um, we're just really crafting each moment and building over the course of um, about a week. And then uh, we have Thanksgiving and then we come back for our first preview the day after Thanksgiving. So we invite you all preview start Friday. We'll put the info on the show in the chat, right? That performances start, is that November 25th? Is that what that is? I think I like, I, 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 I <laughs> we'll, yes. November 25th. I, I'm watching Zoe look at a calendar as, as she's <laughs> on Zoom. Um, and we run through December 24th. So it's really a great, it's a great holiday season celebration. It, this is a story that has always moved me. So I'm just delighted that we get to have it on our stage. Um, I think we all underestimate the importance of our small actions and uh, how how much we matter in ways that we don't anticipate to others, right? That we have impact in ways we don't know. And that's kind of the genius of this story. Um, Joe, do you get tired of seeing different iterations of this piece of yours? Do you ever think, wow, 
I'm, I'm once again doing It's a Wonderful Life, and I'm going to turn on the light here. It got dark where I am, so forgive me. Okay. Uh, no, no, I, I don't, um, because out of all the productions I've seen over all the years, there, there's never been any two that are alike. Um, uh, I feel like it's such a, I, I kind of think of it as a recipe sometimes. It's sort of like, here are some ingredients, and if you take all these ingredients, you can put something together, you know, and, and that that I, I, I love the sense of fun that you're bringing to it in the rehearsal room, and, and that you're finding finding a way to make it specifically, you know, for Hartford for this year and and how um, I really never got tired of it because I feel like every production is different. There are some very different casting, uh, you know, not, not only with the actors, but just it can be broken down a bunch of different ways, you know, in the script there's a suggestion for like, okay, if you do it with five actors, maybe it's done like this. But I'm very open to, oh, okay, you want to try it like that or try it like that. You know, I'm, I'm really open to um, looking at all different ways. And that's been such a joy to see so many different productions from, you know, from, from amateur to, to a production like yours to, you know, and um, they've all found something really special in it. And um, yeah. it's just been such a joy. I mean, even hearing, even knowing it as well as I do from last year, hearing you, Zoe and Liam and Godfrey, it feels new to me. I mean, I can't wait to sort of rejoin the room and just be an audience member for the fun of people creating within this really great story. Uh, and Liam, we should say you're a musician as well. And our sound designer is also a musician. So it's really interesting we get really the privilege of two great musical minds. You guys are collaborating in a different way on this as well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Fred is a friend of mine who worked together in a few different capacities over the years. Um, this is Fred Kennedy, our Fred sound Kennedy, designer. Wonderful, wonderful designer and musician. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm always excited to work with Fred and, uh, you know, working with Fred in a new capacity is, is a, you know, a new way to be excited about that. So um, no, it's great. And I think that, uh, I, I hope he's happy with the mess that I've made for him to untangle uh, when he gets to tech. What is your favorite sound effect right now that you're doing in rehearsal? Like, uh, what's the thing you really like, can't wait to get to? Um, I well, there's one that I don't want to spoil, so I won't say okay. that. But there is one that I really, I really enjoy, and it's kind of a sequence that's just very silly, and I'm a very silly person, and you know. <laughs> It's a, it's a bit that's taken further than it needs to be taken. And it's kind of a bit of like sonic clowning that I really enjoy. Oh, all right. Um, well, we will invite yeah. everyone to sort of, if you come see the show, to identify what the moment is. Yeah, absolutely. Is absolutely. That's right. Um, sonic clowning. That's a great phrase. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> apart from that, I, I love my little prop door. Um, it's so fun. And it's just like a door, but tiny. Uh, and I couldn't walk through it, but I can open it and I can shut it and I can knock it on, knock on it and slam it. And, you know, there's, there's so much uh, expressive potential in a door. It's um, wonderful. Also with the shoes, right? I mean, who's walking? Yeah, shoes are fun. Either sometimes the shoes are independent of what actors are doing. Sometimes you're matching someone's steps. Um, no, it's, it's, all, it's all so much fun. I think I, I recommend people see the show more than once, once to see the production and once just to spy on everything Liam's doing. <laughs> yeah, Liam's acting every part because he has to hit the rhythms of the actors. So Liam's I guess that's true. a one-man <laughs> right. show, one -man show <laughs> up there. That's, yeah. that's pretty cool. Well, thank you all so much. We're going to read a poem as we do um, at the end of Seen and Herds. And I appreciate uh, you three joining me. It's just the four of us reading today. Um, this is a poem of Thanksgiving and we're uh, approaching that holiday, right? Time keeps moving fast, um, speeding us towards these holidays. Um, Thanksgiving being, if we separate it, and I think in a sense the just the, what means something to me, why I love this poem is really the true spirit of giving thanks for everything and using a holiday to celebrate all that we have to be grateful for in a similar vein to what the message of this piece is, right? That it's, there are many things to be grateful for and we often forget that. So in that spirit, um, we're gonna read, uh, <laughs> Let Us Give Thanks by Max Coons. 
And Joe, if you'll start us off. Well, Liam, Liam might kick us Liam's off. Liam's starting us off. I'm in the wrong place. And do. Liam, start us off. Thank you, Zoe. Let us give thanks for a bounty of people, for children who are our second planting, and though they grow like weeds and the wind too soon blows them away, may they forgive us our cultivation and remember fondly where their roots are. Let us give thanks for generous friends with hearts as big as Hubbard's and smiles as bright as their blossoms. For feisty friends as tart as apples, for continuous friends who like scallions and cucumbers keep reminding us we've had them, for crotchety friends as sour as rhubarb and as indestructible, for handsome friends who are as gorgeous as eggplants and as elegant as a row of corn, and the others as plain as potatoes and so good for you. For funny friends who are as silly as Brussels sprouts, and as amusing as Jerusalem artichokes, and serious friends as complex as cauliflowers, and as intricate as onions, for friends as unpretentious as cabbages, as subtle as summer squash, as persistent as parsley, as delightful as dill, as endless as zucchini, and who, like parsnips, can be counted on to see you throughout the winter. For old friends, nodding like sunflowers in the evening time, and young friends, coming on as fast as radishes, for loving friends who wind around us like tendrils and hold us, despite our blights, wilts and witherings, and finally, for those friends now gone, like gardens past that have been harvested, but who fed us in their time, that we might have life thereafter. For all these, we give thanks. Thank you all for reading that with me, and a shout out to James Still, who first sent me this poem. He sends it every year to all his friends. I'm honored to share it with all of you. Um, let's have a toast. So a reminder, if you put in the chat a raise or uh, you raise your hand in the, so you we know to turn on your camera. Is that right? Did I say that right? Goodness me. And I have, I have a bottle of water tonight, not quite as dramatic as, uh, as other as other drinks might be on other evenings, but toasting with water to everybody and wishing everybody happy holidays ahead to sleepy heads I see. And a huge thanks to Hartford stage staff as always for getting us through these. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Scott, for being backstage for us. See you at the theater. Happy holidays. It is a wonderful life. And we'll see you all this season by a subscription. Right? Five play subscription. Here we go. Cheers. Thank you all for joining tonight. Be well and see you at the theater. Take care. Thank you.